talk about a talk here and talk about uh, cerebral folate metabolism. Um, just, uh, I always like to start out with a disclaimer. You know, most of this, the uh, things that we talk about um, are not uh, approved. Um, you know, I'm in the US, that's the FDA, but really of um, any agency. So all of this is really being used off label, which is important if you um, consider any of these treatments to find a physician um, who is uh, knowledgeable and can uh, consult on the risks and benefits of any treatment. So today um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, cerebral folate metabolism and, and problems getting folate into the brain. So um, unlike most of the rest of the body, uh, the uh, brain um, is very highly regulated in what actually comes in and out of it. And that is that uh, there's what we call the blood brain barrier. And here uh, you can see that we have blood where we have the red cells in the middle and that um, there's this barrier here. So some small molecules can get across, but large molecules can't. And this is very selective and this is to regulate. The brain is very sensitive. So we wanna regulate what goes in and out of it. Um, it uh, has some very complicated you know, um, uh, mechanisms. Um, and here we can see that these, uh, the lining of the blood vessels here have these things called tight junctions, which prevent anything from kind of sneaking through um, where they come together. And then you have all these uh, different, um, what we call carriers that carry things across um, the blood brain barrier. And here like the glucose transporter here to get glucose into the brain, which is your kind of major fuel. Um, it really has to be transported. And there's actually a disorder that we know of where this doesn't work and, and you don't get energy into the brain, you don't get glucose into the brain. Um, it's, uh, and this slide is just to kind of impress upon you how complex this is and the different types of transporters and the different things that have to be transported across, including amino acids and, and other things. You have these uh, glucose transporters, but then you also have other very complicated transporters and this is kind of what we're gonna talk about today a little bit, where you actually can't have molecules just kind of go through the cell from one side to the other, but you actually have to pick them up and they, you transport them across the cell and dump them out um, on the other side. The, uh, um, there's uh, different areas in the brain that, uh, um, and different ways to protect it. We have what I was just describing called the blood brain barrier, where you have the blood, the vessel, and then you have mostly astrocytes here, which are supportive cells, which pick this up and bring it um, to the neurons. Um, and then you also have the other areas of the brain, uh, such as the place called the quarry plexus, where um, this, uh, things from the blood are actually um, transported in and they're kind of dumped into the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which is the spinal fluid that surrounds the brain um, and the uh, neurons get their nutrition that way. So one of the most important molecules that we have is uh, folate. So folate's a very, very important vitamin um, and uh, in, in, in it's essential vitamin uh, for a specific reason. It's because it's used in so many metabolic systems. So the brain really needs it to develop and to function. Um, and um, it has to be transported into the brain in, um, in this very special way. And the major way that it's transported in is something called the folate receptor alpha which you can see here. And um, folate here in the form of 5 methotetrahydrofolate binds onto this receptor. And then this receptor is actually brought into the cell um, into a little um, uh, exosome here. And um, it's brought across the cell and then released into the CSF. Um, and the folate receptor alpha here is uh, really big um, compared to this other transporter because it has a high affinity for alpha. It really, I'm sorry, high affinity for folate. It really likes folate. So it binds onto folate and pulls it across. And that's very important because the levels of folate in the brain are about two to three times that of the blood. So you couldn't, even if you wanted to, just have a passage between the blood and the brain, um, uh, folate wouldn't go into there because the, the, the uh, concentration would actually be higher in the brain, it would actually come back the other way. So we have to kind of uh, pull folate uphill into uh, the brain and increase the, uh, the concentration. 
So there's other mechanisms too. There's something called the reduced folate carrier, which we see here, which can bring folate across. Um, but um, you can see it's smaller. It does not like folate as much as the folate receptor alpha. So this is just uh, the kind of the impression of uh, how important uh, folate is. And, uh, and we have different types of folate. You know, the, the one that we're usually um, think of is folic acid and folic acid is a synthetic non-natural form of folate. It's very cheap, so we can fortify our all foods with it. But um, in order for it to be utilized, that is to get into the folate cycle here, it actually has to go through a number of steps, including uh, an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, uh, which uh, many people um, have uh, what we call polymorphism, a little change that makes this less efficient. Um, so it really, uh, the body isn't really great at um, changing folic acid into the folates that we need. So that's the reason why we use um, and, and uh, what we call reduced folates, which have become very popular, like uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate. And what we uh, concentrate on is leucovorin or folinic acid, um, which comes into the folate cycle here before MTHFR. Folate's very important. There are certain um, uh, um, um, uh, pathways that come off of the folate cycle, which are extremely important. So um, folate um, here before MTHFR goes to making purines, and purines are very important for a number of different reasons. We usually think of them as the building blocks of RNA and DNA. So if you don't have these building blocks, actually when you, um, uh, when you um, repair or um, reproduce um, uh, DNA um, or make RNA, you can have decreased fidelity and you can have errors. Um, it's also important for, it's the precursor to make ATP, uh, or adenosine, which is uh, used in the mitochondria. That's the energy molecule of our cell. And also for making GTP, which is the precursor to something called DH4 or tetrahydrobiopterin. And tetrahydrobiopterin is very important because it's a cofactor for making all your monoamine neurotransmitters like serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Um, it's important for nitric oxide production, and nitric oxide is important for regulating blood flow and is, uh, um, has a role in neurotransmission and in phenylalanine metabolism. Um, on the other side of the folate cycle, um, through methionine synthase, um, we, uh, we have folate linked to methylation metabolism. And methylation is very important because it regulates which genes are turned on and off. Um, and this is a very important process in development. That is that you have lots of genes in your genome, but they're only expressed if they're methylated correctly. And if you don't have um, the right methyl groups that you're not gonna be able to turn them on and off as they need to be. And this also feeds into something called redox metabolism, uh, which produces glutathione, uh, which is the major antioxidant of your body. And without glutathione, you're gonna have, uh, you're not gonna be able to control um, oxygen radicals, and you'll have oxidative stress. So on um, this idea that, uh, that there might be some folate problems entering the brain was really introduced by Dr. Rainmakers, um, and, uh, and he uh, uh, is in Belgium at, at um, that time, and he um, um, found, he was studying some kids that seemed to have neurodevelopmental issues, um, and he didn't know why. And one of the things he did was uh, a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture allows us to take some of the CSF off and analyze it. And what he found is that many of these kids, and this is the, one of the first papers he has here, the number of patients and their ages, so um, of all ages, um, was found to have low folate um, in their uh, brain. And he uh, you know, um, linked this to uh, this neurodevelopmental um, issues. Um, interesting, he followed some of these kids along and he actually found that if you look at them over time, that many of them, the folate level actually goes down over time. So it seems to get worse. Um, and some of the other things he correlated was when he looked at the brain, he found that um, many of them had very poor white matter development, um, particularly in this periatrial region, which many times, if, um, if you don't consider something like cerebral folate deficiency, this is um, really kind of akin to birth injury or, um, or cerebral palsy. So you couldn't be mistaken 
um, for that because of these poor areas of white matter development. But um, this was actually linked to cerebral folate. So uh, one of the things uh, is, is that he didn't know why uh, folate was not getting into the brain. He suspected there was folate receptor alpha, that major transport mechanism I described, there was a problem with. And of course, one of the first things he did was say, ah, it must be a genetic disorder. And he sequenced the gene for the folate uh, receptor alpha, but he didn't find any uh, problems. He then um, uh, collaborated with Ed Quatros, who's at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York. And um, Ed was the first one to find out that there was actually these autoantibodies that would bind onto the folate receptor alpha, and it was associated with the syndrome. And this was really the first major report in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005. Um, and they found that these kids with cerebral folate deficiency had um, a certain characteristic. Usually it was an onset of um, less than one year of age. You'd have um, un unrest, irritability many times, neurodevelopmental delays, sometimes neurodevelopmental regression. Sometimes there would be acquired microcephaly, that is the, the brain would not grow and the head wouldn't grow. Um, if, uh, if this went on, you know, sometimes you would see movement disorders um, and sometimes what we call pyramidal signs, um, uh, that is spasticity, that sometimes you see in things like cerebral palsy, um, and then epilepsy and seizures may develop. Kids that did not go on to be treated would have visual disturbances, um, and some had hearing loss. So again, they tried to figure out why this was, and they sequenced the folate receptor alpha, and they found there was no genetic abnormalities that could be found. And then um, Ed Quatros looked at the blood and looked for this antibody to the folate receptor alpha. And we can see here, this is the patients with cerebral folate deficiency um, and the titers of that antibody, and they are much higher, significantly higher than control subjects, uh, suggesting that this was um, possibly a cause of why a folate wasn't getting in um, to the, um, the nervous system. And here we can see kind of in this cartoon um, how um, this um, may work. And what um, Ed Quatros found is that uh, there was two types of antibodies that he um, identified. There was something called a blocking antibody, which you see here. And this um, bind, binded onto the uh, folate receptor alpha and prevented folate, and it took off the space where folate would bind. So folate could not even bind to the folate receptor alpha with the blocking antibody. And then he found a binding antibody, which would bind to somewhere else on the folate receptor alpha and kind of interfere with, with its ability to function. Um, again, one of the ways that was found we could treat this disorder, so one of the exciting things is that it's a treatable disorder, um, so it's, it's not just uh, something you diagnose, um, is that uh, you could use the reduced folate carrier to get folate across um, into the brain. However, there's a, a couple caveats. You know, one, as I had said, the folate receptor alpha does not like folate as much. I'm sorry, the reduced folate carrier does not like folate as much as the folate receptor alpha. So you have to use high doses of folate to get through, and you have to use the reduced folate because it only transports reduced folates. Um, Um, and of course, you know, you may say, well, um, it may be just an epiphenomenon that you find these antibodies um, and, uh, and we don't know that they're actually doing anything. And so um, in order to really um, confirm that they're, they're significant, um, in two studies, we've actually uh, correlated uh, the blocking, the titers of the blocking antibody, which you see here, higher titers, with levels of folate in the CSF. So higher titers are associated with lower levels. And this is a study by Rainmakers. Um, and this is our study from autism. And, and we found a similar correlation, although in autism it's very interesting. Um, here um, in, uh, in, in these patients with cerebral folate deficiency, um, we can see that the normal level is about 40 or below. So we can see a lot of these had frankly below normal folate levels. In autism, we find that the folate level does correlate, but it's below average, below average. Um, and many of them don't have frank cerebral folate deficiency, even though they may have symptoms. 
Um, so um, one of the, uh, the things that uh, that first paper I showed you from the New England Journal of Medicine found is they described this thing called cerebral folate deficiency. Um, but it, it kind of had an incomplete phenotype um, that is the characteristic of the patients. And then they, we had papers like this that started to come out, which um, started to show that these kids with cerebral folate deficiency not only had developmental delays, but they also seemed to have autism. And this was one of the first papers to show that and also showed that treatment with folinic acid or leucovorin actually improved the level from below normal 34 to 113 and also improved um, many of the indices um, of uh, methylation metabolism. Uh, so homocysteine, methionine um, and such are, are SAM and SAW. Um, and also normalized um, neurotransmitters, because uh, if you remember, I said neurotransmitters were um, uh, um, really folates important for producing neurotransmitters. Uh, then we had other papers that start, started to have, um, uh, you know, uh, more cases where um, autism was associated with cerebral folate deficiency. Um, and the first, the papers would uh, have correlated autism with very low function, I'm sorry, autism um, uh, with cerebral folate deficiency with kind of low functioning autism, that is mental retardation. Um, and, uh, and then another paper that showed low functioning autism, so very severe autism with cerebral folate um, deficiency. And um, in this paper, again, what they did is they actually showed that treatment um, 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 improved um, with uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, if folate levels in the cerebral final split improved with uh, treatment with folinic acid or leucovorin. Interestingly, in this study, um, they actually showed that irritability and aggressive behavior, which you see here, was correlated with the titer of the folate receptor alpha antibody. So the antibody, the more severe, um, the uh, um, probably the, uh, the cerebral folate deficiency, the more severe the aggressive behavior. So starting to kind of correlate um, some of the uh, findings and the severity of disease with um, symptoms that we see in autism. I mean, this paper also, uh, Dr. Rainmakers showed that depending on when you start treatment, you may have more uh, severe symptoms. So here we can see the age at which treatment was started um, and the prevalence of symptoms. And we can see that if, um, that if it was started earlier, there was a, a lower um, incidence of autism and mental retardation um, um, versus if it was started later on, which was uh, more severe. Um, also that it was the same thing with many of the um, uh, neurologic and behavioral signs like dyskinesias, movement disorder, and irritability. Um, and as I had shown you in the beginning, cerebral folate deficiency was also associated with these white matter changes um, that are considered many times to be brain damage. But here we can see in this paper, and this is when also um, cerebral folate deficiency was associated with mitochondrial disorders. So this is one of the first papers to show that at least this complex one um, deficiency, mitochondrial disorder, um, that, uh, that you also had cerebral folate deficiency. And one of the reasons for this is, um, as I had mentioned, the uh, process for the folate receptor alpha is to actually pick up folate and bring it across the cell. And so that transport mechanism requires energy. And so the mitochondria is what makes your energy. Uh, so when in mitochondrial dysfunction um, and mitochondrial disease, um, it started to be realized that you had uh, cerebral folate deficiency also. And in this paper, we can see that treatment with leucovorin um, and a mitochondrial cocktail with quibiquinone um, and, uh, and riboflavin actually was able to repair the brain. So you can see, you don't have to be a neuroradiologist to see that this brain looks like it's severely damaged with all these white matter abnormalities. And then three years after uh, this cocktail, which addressed these metabolic defects, you can see that those white matter abnormalities are gone and the brain looks much better. It's not completely normal, but it's much better than it was. Then more cases started to actually um, link mitochondrial disease 
with cerebral folate deficiency. So, um, and in this paper, this is one of the largest case series, they found that 50% of patients they found with mitochondrial disease um, had cerebral folate deficiency. Um, and this is an interesting paper where they looked at something called Alpers disease, which is another mitochondrial uh, disease. Um, and what they showed that the inflammatory markers here, and you can see in IL-6, actually correlated with the level of folate in the CSF. So they seem to go together, um, the inflammation um, and the level of folate, um, suggesting that uh, these things may be very intercorrelated. So, um, uh, of course, mitochondrial disease, and I'll, I'll talk about this in my, my next lecture a, a little bit, but it is usually uh, associated with very low functioning mitochondrial, um, mitochondria, usually about 20% of normal. And as we had been um, researching um, mitochondrial disease in autism, we found that actually some kids with autism have a unique type of mitochondrial disease where complex four is actually functioning 200% of normal. And we found that uh, these patients um, also seem to have cerebral folate deficiency. So of course, the, the question, there was this evidence building that, um, that uh, cerebral folate deficiency could be associated with autism, um, but mostly as kind of case studies. And uh, this is the problem when, when you're studying something like autism where there's lots and lots of kids. Usually cerebral folate deficiency, you need to do a lumbar puncture and measure the levels of folate um, in the CSF. So the question is, how do you um, really uh, figure out whether large numbers of children with autism may have problems with uh, folate um, getting into the brain? So what we decided to do is we studied the uh, folate receptor alpha antibodies that Ed Quatros had found in our clinic. So mostly myself and, and Dan Rosignol um, uh, through our clinic uh, we're very systematic in the way that we evaluate um, patients um, and, and follow symptoms. So what we were able to do is offer um, the patients that came into our clinic the ability to measure these antibodies to look first at the prevalence of how many kids may have these antibodies that may prevent folate from getting into the nervous system. And uh, to our surprise, uh, we found that 60% uh, that, um, had the blocking antibody, either low, medium, or high, and 50% had the binding antibody. And when you look at percentage of who has had at least one or more, 75% of our patients had one or both antibodies um, in their blood. And so that may seem like a gigantic number. It was to us a little unbelievable. Um, so we looked at other studies. And so this at the same time, Dr. Rainmakers was doing this study, he only looked at the blocking antibody um, and uh, he found that uh, about 50%, 47%, about 50% of his kids with autism um, had the blocking antibody in the blood, which was similar to our number, which was our number is a little higher, was at 60%, um, but, uh, but not, uh, not all that much different. And he had uh, developmentally delayed non-autistic controls. And compared to that, only 3% of them uh, seem to have this antibody in their blood. Um, another study that was done through the NIH um, from patients that Sue Suido um, had been studying, um, they measured um, the, the levels of folate in the CSF using lumbar punctures. And so for frank cerebral folate deficiency, they found that 18% of children with autism had um, at some point cerebral folate levels that were below normal. Although you can see that many of these uh, points are close to the lower limit of normal. And what you can see in many of these is that they go down over time, like the original case, original case series of kiddos with cerebral folate deficiency. So that, you know, maybe they weren't deficient out here, but if you give them time, you know, they, it does, can become depleted in the CSF. So, of course, the important thing, you know, for, for us is, you know, not so much diagnosing this, but what can you do about it? Um, so, in our original study, if um, the um, uh, patients were um, uh, positive um, for the antibody, um, we uh, decided that leucovorin 
uh, which is a pretty safe um, compound um, that, uh, that we could uh, offer them treatments and follow them along very closely um, without um, uh, doing a lumbar puncture, although some of them did have lumbar punctures um, to verify their folate levels to begin with. But we offered the parent, parents, it was their decision of whether they wanted to go through that procedure or not, because a lumbar puncture is, you know, uh, not without its risks. I mean, it's usually a very safe procedure, but it does have risks and it can be uncomfortable and it requires anesthesia. So, um, so we uh, decided that uh, we'd offer them standardized treatment with, uh, with leucovorin. And um, so um, the, uh, we treated them with uh, two milligrams per kilogram per day, divided BID a maximum of 50 milligrams per day of leucovorin, or as we were calling it at that time, folinic acid, folinic acid, leucovorin, they're the same compound. We started using really the, the name leucovorin now because so many people, even the experts, would um, confuse folinic acid with folic acid, um, and we wanted to stop that confusion. Um, and what we found, and this is an open label um, type study, um, is that compared to a waitlist control group, that is patients that had gotten the test uh, for uh, the, uh, the antibody but were waiting on results um, and didn't make any changes, um, we had asked them, this waitlist control group and the kids that were treated, um, we asked the parents after about four months to rate uh, nine different symptoms and tell us if they got much better uh, to much worse, they would um, rate how these symptoms um, changed. And so what we found in this first study is that there seemed to be a pattern in things that got better in the kids that were treated uh, with leucovorin. And that was in language, receptive language, expressive language, and verbal communication. We also saw improvements in stereotype behavior um, and um, attention. And this is another way of looking at that data of the percentage that reported improvement versus no change versus worsening. And you can see the ones that showed improvement, um, everything was uh, really the percentage was in receptive language, expressive language, verbal communication, um, and so on. So of course, uh, open label study is uh, you know open to bias. There's a large placebo effect and such. So the next thing that we needed to do was the double blind placebo controls trial to uh, make sure that this you know wasn't due to a placebo effect or or um, uh, parents' um, um, perception. Um, and I think the important thing is that we uh, had kind of keyed on to what was happening is language was improving. And the important thing about verbal communication or language is that it's something that you can measure objectively. That is, it doesn't have to require a uh, subjective observer. We can actually put in an expert that can measure language using a standardized test um, who can tell us, you know, rate the child's language on a very um, uh, uh, standardized scale. And so we randomized 48 children, uh, 23 to uh, leucovorin, 25 to placebo. Um, and what we found is that overall, uh, that uh, after 12 weeks of treatment, verbal communication, and this is the scaled score of a uh, standardized language test, either the preschool language scales or the uh, clinical evaluations of language fundamental, improved significantly in those that were on folinic acid or leucovorin versus placebo. It did seem to improve a little bit on placebo because these children were getting all their therapies, speech therapy, ABA therapy, um, and such. Now, these were all comers. That, you know, some of them were positive for the antibody, some of them were negative. So we asked the question of whether the antibody, positive versus negative, was predictive you know, to see if, again, that's really a factor that uh, that's important for um, uh, for this disorder, and in fact, we did see that uh, that those that were positive uh, for the antibody had a larger effect size. So the effect size overall, all comers, was 0.7, which is a, a medium to large effect size, not bad. Um, but if you were um, positive for the antibody, the effect size was 0.91, which is a large to very large effect size. The um, the other thing that uh, we thought was very important is we calculated something called the number needed to treat. Um, and that is how many children do you have to treat to actually see this significant effect? And of course, you know, I always kid that when you go to the doctor, you think the number needed to treat should be one, right? You go to the doctor, they give you the medication, 
<laughs> and you get better. <laughs> but it ends up in clinical trials. Um, number needed to treat usually is somewhere between four and six. That is, you have to treat four to six patients to get the desired effect. So 1.8, which is greater than one and two, is, uh, is, is a really good effect size. In addition, we were able to calculate an equivalent um, how many hours of speech therapy leucovorin is. And we found that um, in that three months, it was equal to 177 hours. And when you consider that most kids get about one hour of speech therapy a week, you know, this is um, three years of therapy. Or if you calculate how much you pay the speech therapist, that's about $7,000 for a $300 prescription. One of the concerns that um, people you know, um, had, uh, we saw in, um, in our early trial, an open label trial, is that some kids would get very excited and hyperactive um, when starting leucovorin. So what we were able to do in our double blind trial was uh, since we measured side effects, we asked about specific side effects at certain intervals, we were able to look at the change in uh, where we, agitation or excitement um, over the trial period. And what we found is that in the beginning, in the first six weeks, um, excitement and agitation was about the same between the placebo and the leucovorin, but then after nine weeks, it precipitously dropped in those that were treated. Now, um, luckily, we're not the only ones to be doing this. And we really um, uh, appreciate our, our French colleagues who um, not only um, took this, uh, you know, replicated some of our studies in uh, what we call a single blind uh, placebo control, but they used something called the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. So instead of just looking at language, which is really not a, a core symptom of autism, they, uh, they looked at, they took the ADOS, which measures core symptoms of autism to see if it improved. And in their study, um, they found that those that were on placebo, there is no change in the ADOS, and those that were on leucovorin, there is a significant improvement in the ADOS score. Um, other things, uh, I'd like to mention other things that will help um, with this disorder. Um, one of the things that uh, was found by uh, Dr. Rainmakers um, was that milk uh, seems to um, increase the titer. And in this study, he actually put kids on a milk-free diet and showed that the titer of the antibody dropped precipitously and that re-exposure to milk increase the titer. So we always recommend a milk-free diet. Um, and not in human studies, but in some animal studies, this has been looked at. And in this study, um, in mice, they found that vitamin D actually upregulates um, the, uh, the reduced folate carrier. So that, that accessory pathway that brings folate into the brain when the folate receptor alpha isn't working. Um, and vitamin D is very important we find it deficient in a lot of kids um, with, with autism. Um, and then the other study on mice has shown that PQQ, which helps with mitochondrial function, actually um, signals and upregulates uh, some of the molecular machinery that produces the reduced folate carrier. So another way of um, improving that uh, accessory pathway. So uh, what's the next step with this, including more clinical trials, what we're doing? Uh, the other implications are, are interesting too and important is that uh, what we find is that uh, you have this on the blood-brain barrier, this reduced folate carrier and the folate receptor alpha. And again, it can be dysfunctional because of these antibodies that bind to folate receptor alpha or mitochondrial dysfunction. But this same transport mechanism is also on the placenta. Um, and we find that about half of the mothers of kids with the antibody also have the antibody. And this suggests that prenatally, um, there may be some blocks in, uh, in folate uh, transport across the placenta to the child. Um, and so in order to look at this further, uh, Dr. Quatros developed an animal model where he exposes rats to the folate receptor alpha antibodies during gestation and weaning, um, and, um, and so he exposes the mother and he finds out with certain behavioral tests that the babies that come out have uh, behavioral deficiencies that are not unlike autism. And um, if he gives the, uh, the mother rats um, either uh, folinic acid, leucovorin, 
or a steroid, um, he can actually rescue uh, their behavior. Um, and um, he showed that, uh, that indeed the folate receptor alpha anti, um, autoantibody binds onto the placenta um, and that markers of inflammation um, increase in those that, uh, that have the antibodies. So it causes inflammation at the placenta. And one of the things that we know is that uh, prenatal inflammation seems to be associated with autism. Um, and then he's also measured um, flux of folate across the placenta actually showing that, uh, that these antibodies do um, reduce transport of folate across the placenta. So other um, studies are now starting to show that um, if you look at families of the uh, kids with autism, um, that uh, you know the folate receptor alpha antibody is increased in prevalence, um, you know, um, in uh, in kiddos with autism, but then also in the mother and the father and the sibling, but not in control families. So suggesting this is actually something that runs in families and may be some type of inherited factor. Um, some work by Dr. Rainmakers, uh, some kind of preliminary work on his clinical cohort. He looked at uh, families where the kid was positive uh, for the folate receptor alpha and also tested the parents. And he uh, found two things. One, and here we can see like kid positive, mom negative, father negative versus kid positive, mother positive, father positive. And these um, orange bars are the CARA scores um, which is a, a measure of, um, uh, of, uh, of autism severity um, before treatment. And you can see that the, when the kid's positive, um, it's down here. When everybody in the family is positive, it's up here. So there may be a role that there may, that some of these kids may have a double hit. That is, they may have a full eighth deficiency before birth, prenatally, um, and after birth. Um, how the father is, um, uh, um, actually involved in there is something that, that seems to be coming up in the data, but we really don't know um, why that is specifically. Um, also, what he found is that uh, these kids um, are harder to treat. So, um, so, sorry, the blue bars are baseline, and then the orange bars are after treatment. And what we can see is that at baseline, more severe if more people in the family have the antibody, and the change with treatment is much lower um, in the kids where there's um, uh, more people in the family have the antibody, suggesting this might be a more severe uh, form of autism. Um, and then again, what happens if, um, you know, the, uh, the mother, uh, this is a cartoon of if the mother and father are positive, seems to be more severe autism that is hard to reverse, whereas if either the father or the mother are positive, you might have a less, you might have severe autism, but it's partially reversible. And then we have the cases where mother and father are negative. Um, and you ask, well, what happens? How do those kids get the antibody? And, and um, it's, it may be that things like animal milk at different points of development may trigger um, the uh, folate receptor alpha antibody um, to be uh, produced. So with that, I'll thank you um, for your attention. Uh, hello, I'm a mother of a child who is not autistic. Uh, he has developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, he was born with spina bifida occulta and he has blocking antibody 1, 19. Uh, so you have children who are not respond very well on leucovorin, but they do wonderfully on 5-MTHF uh, or some children that, that, that have frequent seizure activities, like in my child's case. I don't know if it's because of uh, his slow brain activity or mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, I was wondering, uh, can 5-MTHF be as effective in therapy as folinic acid is? 
Uh, I have read that 5-NTHF can get into cells in two ways, uh, as it can bypass the blocking antibody where leucovorin cannot bypass. I don't know if that's true. Also, do you maybe prefer methylfolate over calcium folinate in children who have MTHFR677 homozygous gene mutation? And what is the dosage per kilogram? So, um, also um, consider this MTHFR. Uh, if there is a problem with absorption or conversion from 5-formyl tetrahydrofolic acid to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolic acid, uh, in children who have MTHFR homozygous, when they have 50% or more reduction of the enzyme activity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I get this question a lot. So first of all, yeah, the, yeah. Um, uh, the idea that child may have spina bifida suggests that, uh, that if you're a child, that you may have the antibody, and it may be uh, kind of a double hit. That I they're... don't have it. Okay. Not even my husband. Okay. Um, so, um, well, then, it, you know, it suggests there was a folate problem, though, before, you know, birth, birth. Um, also. Um, and that may be because, you know, we, we find um, that, uh, of course, the folate autoantibody is only one mechanism that, that, we're block, that blocks uh, folate metabolism. Um, so uh, there's multiple ones, and I think we're trying to figure out the complicated nature of it. So um, the, the question about, uh, um, you know, um, methotetrahydrofolate versus uh, leucovorin, um, um, of course, the, the, the answer is we don't know, you know, so anybody that tells you anything, you know, yeah. uh, we, we don't know. I, I can't even tell you that because uh, we haven't done the studies. And I'll tell you why we use leucovorin, mm -hmm. you know, um, the reason why we use leucovorin, you know, and, and this is kind of akin, you know, um, to uh, what was described with Bumex is that uh, it's a drug that's been used for decades. Uh, so we know about its kinetics. We know how it gets into the, uh, the blood, um, to pass the blood brain barrier. Um, we know its safety. So, you know, so we have a lot of knowledge about it, you know, so that's, uh, that's a really good thing. <clears throat> um, so really, um, um, and the reason, one of the reasons um, why I like leucovorin, you know, I'll tell you is one, um, is that the gut microbiome um, actually metabolites um, half of it or more into methotetrahydrofolate. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get both the best of both worlds, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because uh, everybody, you know, makes this big thing about the MTHFR, you know, um, which I don't know that there's, you know, besides things like, you know, it's a severe, a severe you know, um, uh, form of getting, you know, hypohomocysteinemia and, and such. Um, um, in autism, I think that a lot of it's a little bit overblown as far as the evidence of what it does. Uh, so, and I think we have to look at it, you know, I mean, I think it's important, but there's a lot of other important, you know, enzymes and, and, and polymorphisms. Um, but um, I, I think that actually, if you have, um, it, it may be that if you're heterozygous for one of the polymorphisms, it actually may be beneficial. And, and they've taken down my slides, but the reason why I say that is because, um, and I try to make a point to this, before MTHFR, you know, folate is, um, is diverted to making purines, which is important for making ATP um, and GTP, um, which um, is important for making neurotransmitters. Both of those things we know that uh, kids with autism tend to be deficient in, that is the mitochondria may be um, deficient, it could use more um, you know, precursor to ATP, you find low levels of, of certain neurotransmitters and tetrahydrobiopterin deficiency in some kiddos. Um, and there's uh, many times we see errors in, uh, um, in re replicating DNA. So I think that um, actually diverting it more to purines, you know, could be, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of an open question, but I, I think it's just, um, uh, you know, it's just an example of how much we don't know you know, and how much, you know, people say things, you know, and make assumptions, you know, that, uh, that may or may not be true. So for now, I'm sticking with leucovorin. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Dobar dan. Htela sam da pitam, ukoliko dete po FRAT testu, znači nema 
blocking, nego binding, da li postoji mogućnost da je samo isključivanje mleka može da se postigne efekat ili mora da se uvede i leukovorin u punoj dozi? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, milk, I always recommend a, a milk-free diet, you know, um, not a dairy-free diet necessarily, you know, it's important to get your calcium, you know, um, but milk itself, um, you know, I, I say that milk is for babies, you know, <laughs> and, and that's why, you know, it was kind of invented is for babies, and if you think about the body, your body turns off um, lactase, um, you know, at about, for, for about two-thirds of us, you know, after about two years of age. And I think there evolutionarily, there's a reason for that. And that's for milk is for babies. And that um, it can be um, somewhat inflammatory uh, to the gut, you know, in, in older children. So I always recommend a, um, a milk-free diet just in general. Um, but um, uh, I don't, um, uh, you know, my recommendation always is to uh, treat with leucovorin, you know. Um, and uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, several, you know, one, it's, it's pretty safe. There's a little downside to it. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I didn't go into this in the study, but it's very interesting. After some of these kids were started on leucovorin and milk was reintroduced, um, they, uh, the, uh, the levels in the CSF stayed um, normal. So, um, so the, the milk didn't have the same effect, you know, um, after the child was started on leucovorin. And going back to the other question, um, actually there, there's no evidence that leucovorin uh, or methylfolate, um, uh, there's no published evidence that they, uh, that they uh, compete with the antibody, but we do have unpublished evidence that leucovorin, probably one of its mechanisms of action is to compete with the antibody and knock it off the, uh, uh, the uh, folate receptor and restore function. So, you know, uh, so, so I, I see little downside of, of, of treating with leucovorin, um, so I usually um, recommend it. I would like to one more question. Uh, what do you think of high doses of leucovorin and long-term toxic effects of folic excess? So um, definitely there seems to be a literature on long-term um, excess to folic acid and um, more and more research is coming out you know you would think we have, would have done this a long time ago but uh, we're finding that folic acid actually at, at high doses and maybe not so high doses in, in some people um, uh, seems to have um, actually a negative regulatory effect on folic folate metabolism um, and turns off certain enzymes whereas uh, reduced folates such as methotetrahydrofolate and folinic acid, leucovorin, don't have those effects. So the, you can go to higher doses without having negative effects on uh, folate metabolism. Um, there are you know, some theoretical you know, effects of folates um, long-term, but uh, people have looked um, so far and they really haven't found that the, those theoretical you know, um, effects of just folates in general seem to have a long-term toxic effect. Of course, you know, I always monitor you know, labs, I mount it to the patient. Um, after some time, sometimes we try and take children off of leucovorin to see if it's needed. Um, and uh, many times they regress, you know, they seem to need it. Um, the dose, you know, that we've used in the studies, um, you know, 25 milligrams twice a day, you know, is based on kind of the studies, the studies of the pharmacokinetics, that that seems to be what's really optimally absorbed and anything above that really doesn't get absorbed much. But um, in older children, um, that um, it does seem that uh, that higher doses may be beneficial, um, and um, and especially kids with seizures, I've been able to actually improve epilepsy with um, with higher doses of leucovorin, um, and uh, and so um, sometimes it, it may be you know worth trying. So again, you know I don't assume anything. I try it. If it doesn't work, you know then you, you back down. You know, and you want to monitor things, you want to be very careful about this. But it seems like, um, you know, uh, there's a good safety profile with it. So, you know, <clears throat> compared to a lot of other medications that we use long term, you know, I think that, uh, that it has a relatively, you know, better safety profile. When you say high dosages, how high do you, are you to talking about? So, um, 
So, uh, you know, usually, you know, our, our dose is 25 milligrams twice a day, but um, I have kids, especially adolescents and adults that have, that are on 50 or 75 milligrams twice a day. Um, I had one kid that came to me that was on 150 three times a day, you know, without any side effects. Uh, we ended up backing down on that. I think that was a little bit too high. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's an individual thing. Some kiddos, you know, we, um, uh, there's evidence, uh, so Dr. Quattro's has some nice evidence that when it's given, um, you know, non-orally, you know, either injected, you know, or um, IV that, um, that you get higher doses in the brain, you know, and I know there are people doing studies where they're using it IV, and I have patients that are on IVIG um, that uh, sometimes I'll give them a dose of 300 milligrams um, when they get their IVIG, you know, I'm not going to put an IV in just to do that, but if they're getting an IV anyway, and they seem to have a folate problem, you know, I'll, I'll give them a high dose. And, and that isn't, and I'm saying that's a high dose, but if you look at um, really the, um, uh, the guidance for using methotrexate rescue, you know, in cancer, that's, that's pretty much along the doses that they use. Uh, so we know the safety of it is pretty good to use at those high doses. Thank you very much. Okay, we have, we'll take one more question. Uh, hello, uh, my son is 22 years old and uh, uh, through all the testing that we've done until now, we have noticed that he has a problem with folic metabolism. And he was um, supplemented with different kinds of uh, B vitamins. Uh, at the moment, he is receiving homocysteine uh, as a supplement. Uh, do you think this, uh, I, I can't pronounce, <laughs> uh, would be more beneficial for him than other stuff that he used? B12, adenosyl B12, and different kind of what, what is the supplement? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 homocysteine. Homos homocysteine, sorry. <laughs> so homocysteine, they're giving him homocysteine, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, it's just the name of a supplement. I, I assume it would contain, contain different, yes. It's the name of a supplement that oh, okay. contains all <laughs> the nutrients that support lowering the homocysteine. Yeah, I, I maybe, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with the supplement, but... Um, you know, folate isn't the only, you know, uh, you know, vitamin, especially by itself. Um, I think that uh, it's important at least to have uh, um, a folate and B12 together. So, um, I, you know, we find that like for B12 shots that we give um, uh, folate um, or leucovorin with them um, because we find that you have a much better um, effect and lower side effects when you give those together. So definitely, you know, um, when things are combined, B6 is very important for the pathway too. So um, riboflavin. So you, you want to, you know, there are probably is some type of optimal supplement <laughs> to put together. Um, uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly what it is. And, and the, really the bottom line is it's what works for your child. You know, and I think that's what we see again and again. I can come up here and tell you, you know, what the studies show, but we know that, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, and you have to try different things. I know it can be frustrating, you know, uh, it can be side effects because of formulation or some kids are just sensitive to B vitamins. Um, but um, you have to find out what works for your child, yeah. Um, Moj sin je klasičan primjer ovoga što ste vi danas ovdje pokazali i od ovoga na neki način reagovanja na mlijeko i ostalo. Nažalost, kasnije sam malo saznala za lukovorin i on je odmah odreagovao na njega. Moje pitanje nije usmjereno nekako na to, već me zanimao jedna stvar, budući da ja mislim da vjerovatno ja imam ta autoantitijela na te polatne receptore i da sam možda ja to već i tokom trudnoće na djete prenio i da možda je imao i on taj već tada nedostatak cerebralnog polata. I mene zanima da li postoji nešto na osnovu čega što bi ukazivalo kada se djete rodi, znači kada je novorođenče, da djete ima taj problem. 
A recimo, evo sad ću još nešto reći, što sam ja primetila i kod druge djeci, kod svog sina, kad je bio novorađenče, on je imao hipotoniju, odnosno imao je distoniju, dakle hipertonu s leđine strane, hipotoniju ove strane, išli smo sa dva i po mjeseca na vježbe, imao i tortikolis, a sa godina dana kad je uvjedeno kravlje mlijeko, znači djete je grozno reagovalo i mislim da se tada desila određena vrsta, da kažem, povlačenja i nazadovanja u njegovom, nažalost, razvoju. Ja to tada nisam povezala s mlijekom, to jest ja sam pitala, ali su meni rekli da to nije to. To je moje pitanje i zahvaljujem vam na izvanrednom predavanju i trud. Hvala vam i hvala vam za pitanje. One of the things we really like to do um, is uh, actually identify, you know, um, these biomarkers, um, you know, or biomarkers of folate metabolism abnormality uh, that uh, that we can use at birth or before birth, um, so we can uh, understand, you know, what uh, what is the best treatment. You know, we do uh, think that uh, in some cases, you know, of autism, and it seems to be that uh, that prenatally. These uh, these factors are affecting the way the the child's um, uh, brain develops, so it wouldn't be unusual for them at birth to actually show uh, these type of signs. This isn't something that's been studied, but I, I think that uh, you know your your observations are, are probably spot on. Is that uh, is that probably um, the uh, the uh, the effect uh, happened before birth? You know, as the child's brain was developing, and then at birth was had some uh, what we call kind of soft neurological signs um, that are hard to quantify. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I think um, one of the important things, you know, and that's why we're, we're trying to concentrate on the parents and look at these families is, uh, you know, how do you identify these families are at risk and intervene before birth so you have a, a very healthy pregnancy um, and, uh, and successful pregnancy and you protect the child. Sorry again, sure. uh, just to clarify. Um, so uh, you suggest that uh, we stay on leucovarin therapy even if my child um, doesn't respond well and he has more frequent seizures. Uh, so he's more frequent seizures on the leucovarin? Yeah. Or? yeah. Um, yeah uh, it's and, just only 15 milligrams. Yeah, so I, I, again, I can't give clinical advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these cases are very uh, complex, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, and sometimes we do see higher doses are effective. Sometimes, you know, um, we do see, you know, um, you know, seizures in the brain is very complex, you know, and we actually find that many times by making the brain work better, you know, you can see things like more seizures, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the brain may have been so dysfunctional, wasn't able to see as before time. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this is where you really need a very good neurologist you know, to work with you to find out what the best treatment is, you know, for your child. And it probably depends on the type of epilepsy and other factors. So, you know, I can't give you a straightforward answer, um, whether leucovorin is bad, good, or, you know, you know the reason for it. Um, but uh, it sounds very complex and, and, and these cases are very complex and need to be kind of looked at carefully and many things need to be tried to, to actually to, to balance things. Uh, sorry, uh, can problem with gut influence leucovarin efficiency? Um, again, the, the uh, you know the scientific answer is we don't know, but um, but I would think most definitely we know that the the gut and this is something that's very interesting with the microbiome is that uh, that it's important for vitamin production and for um, interconversion of different forms, you know, of uh, vitamins. So yeah, so the the gut is important. It, it um, changes in the normal circumstance, it changes uh, leucovorin or folinic acid uh, to um, methotetrahydrofolate in more than 50% of what's given, um, which, which, you know, I, I think could be a good thing. Um, but if you're going to have gut disturbances, you know, um, one, the, the bacteria, you know, may interfere with, you know, absorption, um, and it could uh, change the forms of folate that are delivered to the body. So I think it's, it's very important that the microbiome has a, a profound, you know, effect, especially on all these oral medications and oral supplements that we give. 
Okay, and one more question, sorry. Should B12 shots be given continuously or periodically? Um, for, you know, again, it's, it's patient by patient, <laughs> but I find that in most of my patients, they do well on at least every other day. You know, I used to do, you know, the protocol that we've really looked at in research is every third day. Um, so I always used to start with every third day and then adjust it. But um, I found that at least every other day seems to be so effective that I usually start now with every other day uh, shots. Okay, this was the last question. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Thank Fry. Uh, I think there will no be discussion because we had quite a few questions after each speaker.